Welcome to week five of our course on administrative law. The first hour of our discussion, the last time we met in the physical classroom, we somehow got onto the topic of the 25th Amendment. Not really on the syllabus. In these interesting times, there are already some key syllabus subjects that are very much topical and in flux. This is one of them. Today, we turn to the so-called Chevron Doctrine. But first, some takeaway. Agency actions are presumptively reviewable. APA Section 706 lists standards, failing any one of which requires holding action unlawful and setting it aside. Some of the 706 standards apply generally, some do not. Courts expect an agency's contemporaneous explanation of its actions. Arbitrary and capricious review looks for a rational connection between the whole record and the agency's contemporaneous explanation of the action it took. Last week, we examined the principal cases in which the Supreme Court has explained and applied APA Section 706-2A's arbitrary or capricious standard of review. Now we turn to section 7062C. Is the agency action in excess of statutory jurisdiction, authority, or limitations, or short of statutory right? Here it appears that courts should be right at home. Unlike arbitrary or capricious review, when courts read statutes, they aren't called upon to oversee the reasoning of agencies in deciding highly specialized and technical tasks like routing freeways. Besides, as John Marshall, first Chief Justice of the U.S., declared in Marbury v. Madison, it is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial branch to say what the law is. The text of the APA itself seems to echo Justice Marshall. Section 706, Scope of Review. The reviewing court shall decide all relevant questions of law and interpret constitutional and statutory provisions. But what weight, if any, should a reviewing court give to an interpretation an agency has already used and applied in the course of administering the statute it was created or recruited by Congress to administer? In the pre-APA Hearst Publications case, the court was called upon to decide whether the National Labor Relations Board had misunderstood the term employee, as used in the Wagner Act. The NLRB read the term as including so-called newsboys, grown men who hawked Hearst newspapers on the streets. As employees, the newsboys would have the right to organize and collectively bargain with Hearst for better pay and working conditions. Hearst, of course, preferred a weaker and more flexible workforce and argued that Congress, in using the word employee, had meant to track the common law distinction between employees and independent contractors. Independent contractors were not covered by the Wagner Act. The court rejected Hearst's argument, but that was not yet to agree with the board. The court went on to say, where the question is one of specific application of a broad statutory term in a proceeding in which the agency administering the statute must determine it initially, the reviewing court's function is limited. The board's determination that specified persons are employees under this act is to be accepted if it has a warrant in the record and a reasonable basis in law. The word deference is not used by the court, but the court's attitude toward the agency seems deferential. Another pre-APA case decided that same term had to do with whether on-call time counts as work time for purposes of eligibility for overtime pay under the Fair Labor Standards Act. Here, after noting the lack of formality involved in the agency's coming up with its reading of the statutory term, in the absence of any statutory direction to defer to the agency's interpretation, the court stated, puzzlingly, that the agency's expertise and experience, though not controlling, were factors which give its reading the power to persuade, 
if lacking power to control. Does not sound very deferential. How did the APA change things? The 1984 Chevron case is our landmark. Like the airbags case, it arose as a challenge to a deregulatory action by an official of the incoming Reagan administration. In this case, an action by the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. At issue was the meaning of the term stationary source in two different statutes. In the Clean Air Act amendments of 1977, the terms major stationary source and major emitting facility mean any stationary facility or source which directly emits 100 tons or more per year of specified pollutants. And in the Clean Air Act, first passed in 1970, stationary source means any building, structure, facility, or installation which emits any air pollutant. A grouping of polluting activities on adjacent properties but under common control counts as a source, but what about the components within that grouping? Are they counted as sources too? If a permit is required for each new or modified source, then an interpretation that penetrates the bubble will subject polluters to stricter regulation. In 1980, the EPA promulgated the so-called bubble rule. The EPA already distinguished between non-attainment areas, where the air was really filthy, and prevent serious deterioration, or PSD areas, where the air was cleaner but could get worse. Permitting was stricter in the non-attainment areas. The 1980 bubble rule defined the term stationary source this way. In PSD areas, the term applied plant-wide, but in non-attainment areas, the term source applies both plant-wide to the bubble and to components within the bubble. That way, in the non-attainment areas, a permit would be required to replace major emitting components. The permit would only allow replacement with the cleanest available technology. In 1981, the Reagan EPA revised the rule so that in non-attainment areas, dirty technology could be replaced with equally dirty technology. A permit was not required because the amount of pollution escaping from the plant-wide bubble would be unchanged. In effect, the 1981 revised bubble rule grandfathered in older technologies in non-attainment areas. The issue for decision in Chevron was, what did the term stationary source in the Clean Air Act mean? The court found the statutory language ambiguous. But rather than decide which would be the better reading, the court declared that its task was rather to determine whether the agency's reading was reasonable. If the agency's reading of ambiguous statutory language was reasonable, the court would let it stand. This is the celebrated Chevron Doctrine, or at least the first cut. The first question for the court is, has Congress spoken clearly to the precise issue? Or is the statute silent or ambiguous? This is called Chevron Step one. If Congress has spoken clearly and directly, then the inquiry is over. The court and the agency are to follow Congress. But what if the statute is silent or unclear? In that case, the next question is not what is the best reading of the statute, but is the agency's reading unreasonable or is it not reasonable? This is step two. If the agency's reading of an ambiguous statute is reasonable, then the court is to defer to the agency, but otherwise hold the agency action unlawful and set it aside. And what about the case before it? Justice Stevens, writing for the court, went to step two. 
the language of Section 302J is not precisely directed to the question of the applicability of a given term in the context of a larger operation. And at step two, found the agency reading not unreasonable. It is certainly no affront to common English usage to take a reference to a major facility or major source to be connote an entire plant as opposed to its contentious constituent parts. Adding, to the extent any congressional intent can be discerned from this language, it would appear that the listing of overlapping illustrative terms was intended to enlarge rather than to confine the scope of the agency's power to regulate particular sources in order to effectuate the policies of the Act. At step two, the court found the agency's 1981 interpretation not unreasonable as striking a balance between two goals, clean air and economic growth. The fact that the balance had already been struck in a different way before simply showed that the statutory term was flexible. Agency interpretations are not instantly carved in stone, the court wrote. And an agency to which Congress has delegated policymaking responsibilities may properly rely upon the incumbent administration's views of wise policy. So the Chevron opinion, unlike the opinion for the court in the airbags case, comes out explicitly in favor of a new administration's policy and in favor of a change in agency behavior. Insofar as what is involved is interpretation, Chevron seems to echo Sir Edward Cook's urging to Parliament. In a doubtful thing, interpretation goes always for the king. Justice Scalia joined the court two years after Chevron was decided. He became Chevron's most fervent advocate. He wrote the opinion for the court in the MCI versus AT&T case. It tells us a lot about how much room, or how little, a statutory ambiguity opens up for deference to the agency at step two. The agency action under review was the FCC's relieving non-dominant carriers in the long-distance telephone market of a requirement that they periodically file with the FCC and adhere to a rate tariff. The dominant carrier, AT&T, still had to adhere to this requirement. AT&T was unhappy with this. It had to publish and stick to a rate while its upstart competitors were free to charge less and steal customers. The issue isn't addressed in our casebook excerpt, but the FCC could probably have survived arbitrary or capricious review. The idea was to promote competition, and in a market in which one carrier was dominant, the public interest in competition could only be served in ways that encouraged market entry. But the issue is not whether the FCC had sound reasons to do what it did. The issue is whether it had statutory authority to do it. The FCC pointed to this language in its enabling act. The commission may modify any requirement under the act to file tariffs for services and rights. Had Congress spoken to the precise issue? And even if it hadn't, and the statute was ambiguous, wasn't the FCC reading reasonable? The word modify is key. It is a statutory term of art, and anyway, at least one's dictionary endorsed the agency's usage is not uncommon. Wouldn't that make it reasonable? Modify. The FCC modified. With language, ambiguity abounds. So even if some dictionaries would not count changing a whole lot as modifying, the ambiguity should go to the agency under Chevron Step 2, shouldn't it? Not so fast, the court says. We're not done with Step 1 yet. Not until an ambiguity remains even after the traditional tools of statutory interpretation have been brought to bear. Ambiguity abounds, but context usually helps reduce it. Consider this expression, bank failure. What does it make you think of? A breach in a riparian boundary, 
or the insolvency of a financial institution. Suppose an agency finds a surveyor for a careless land survey. Is that allowed? The ambiguity would easily be resolved by looking at the statutory context. A careless surveyor might be penalized for causing a levy to fail, but hardly for causing the lender that held the note on flooded land nearby to fail. An agency that regulates financial institutions could hardly claim authority to penalize a surveyor for causing a bank failure under a statute that had to do with waterways. At step one, the court holds that modifying the statute means non-major change. It rejects the agency reading of modify as meaning any change. Well, can the agency action be upheld as a non-major change in the tariff scheme? The court says no. Beyond the word itself, an agency's interpretation of a statute is not entitled to deference when it goes beyond the meaning that the statute can bear. How can this be squared with Chevron? Justice Scalia says. In holding that the EPA's was a permissible interpretation to which Chevron deference was owed, we did not rely exclusively upon dictionary definitions, but also upon contextual indications. What are the contextual indications in MCI? The court says that Congress set up a tariffing scheme and that a departure from that for 40% of a major sector of the industry is much too extensive to be considered a modification, that is, a non-major change. No deference going on here. The broad agency reading of modify is rejected at step one, and the agency's fallback argument that its action is a non-major change, the court rejects at step two. It is unreasonable to say that such an extensive change is non-major.